So it starts with an M and ends with an O. Both of the bros that we are talking about today. The fitness industry is missing the mark on protein. And I have the research to back that up. But this analysis honestly just wasn't very good. So we all thought that protein was kind of a settled thing. Well, a gram per pound, a little bit under, probably fine. All the research kind of points to that. But no, apparently it was not settled, as we'll see in this video. For the record, I don't really have a dog in this fight. I took Mano Henselman's PT course. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really, really good. And I also do like Milo. I think he's really funny. And his music video on length and partials is one of the greatest pieces of fitness content to have ever been made. But by the end of this video, I will tell you definitively who is right. I think there is a pretty clear answer here, uh, as well as my recommendation for protein intake and what I personally do, which is a little bit different from pretty much everyone involved here. There has been a relative consensus in evidence-based fitness. And for many years, there was peace. But recently, the peace has been disturbed. In contrast to the popular science-based narrative, there likely is a benefit to higher protein intakes for lifters. A new meta-analysis is making the rounds showing that supposedly the benefits of protein go up to 3.1 gram per kilogram, almost twice as much as previously believed. So is it time for a paradigm shift or are people crying wolf? So what has kind of been the gold standard for recommending protein intakes has been the Morton study from 2018, which had a who's who of people working on it. Dr. Eric Helms, Ben Henselman, Stu Phillips, James Krieger, Brad Schoenfeld, Alan Aragon, some other people who I don't recognize, but I'm sure are great. That is a star studded lineup for sure. And I think this meta-analysis was really, really well done. Meta-analyses are the gold standard of scientific research since they look at dozens of studies. Now, as Milo said, meta-analysis is the gold standard. It is at the top of the pyramid, but it is not all knowing. If you put garbage studies in, you get garbage results out. So you have to be able to carefully curate what goes into your meta-analysis, which I think the paper that Milo references might have had some issues with. Which plots all of the subjects, muscle growth and protein intakes from all of the studies on one graph. This allows you to draw a line through the data that should be the best fit for the data points. And so basically you take all your studies, you plot them out, then you try to find a line of best fit or maybe two lines of best fit where, okay, you're getting gains up to here and then you see a little bit of a plateau. That's what the Morton study did. Okay, we have gains, 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 past 1.6, there doesn't really seem to be any kind of benefit. There are a lot of different ways to try to fit a line to the data. Straight line, break point, some kind of squiggle. You could do a squirtle analysis. I'm just kidding, that's not a... I made that up. That's not a, that's a Pokemon. That's not a, a, that. So that's the Morton study. I think really, really well done. I've referenced it many, many times, even from my Quora days back in like 2019, the OGs know. Getting to the Tagawa study. Now this does, as Milo says, have more studies. There are more studies in this meta-analysis, which means it's better, right? Because we're dealing with over 70 studies here, I'm pretty confident that this is a true effect. While this study is stronger than the study by Morton and colleagues, it's the only thing you want to do all day. Make your mind up. Uh oh! I'm gonna whoop your ass. That everyone is relying on. Not necessarily. More does not equal better. Bigger does not equal better. If you put more in, if it's bad, that doesn't mean you're gonna get a better result. For instance, in the title, they have muscle mass, but then everywhere else in the study, they have lean body mass. Those are not the same. Man, even the researchers are clickbaiting us nowadays because everyone is interested in muscle mass, but they didn't actually measure that. It's just lean body mass, which is not the same. Also, the inclusion criteria had studies as low as two weeks. If I told you, hey bro, we're gonna test low protein and high protein, so do high protein for two weeks and see if you make better gains, you'd be like, two weeks, what, what? You need at least a month, probably longer than a month in order to see any kind of reasonable expectation of having any kind of change. So yeah, two weeks, it almost seems like they just wanted to get as many studies as possible. They didn't control for calories. That's ridiculous. If you wanna test the impact of protein, on lean body mass, you have to control for calories because now you don't know, oh, they're eating more protein. Are they also eating more calories? If you increase your protein a ton, you're probably gonna be eating more overall calories 
just because you're eating more meals. They didn't control for meal frequency either. So the group with higher protein intakes, was it the protein? Or was it just more food? If anything, this is just evidence that bulking works. I think most egregiously, they didn't report their results. So you look at the previous Morton analysis, there are dots here. You can see them floating around. You can kind of like make your own judgment because they reported their data. The Tagawa study didn't. And this is like a, a power lifter with a herniated disc. No dots to speak of. Show me the dots, Milo. Where are the dots? Yes, they actually did not present their data. The graph you see is just the theoretical graph of the model. It's what the model expects the relationship to be, not including the effect sizes. And just showing the final output of the model is a lot like saying, just trust me, bro. This allows you to draw a line through the data so they had two groups with resistance training and without resistance training. Personally, I just ignore the without resistance training because, like, who gives a shit, right? The group with resistance training gained just under half a kilo. The group without resistance training gained just over half a kilo. So, Milo, if you really want to follow this paper, you should stop lifting. Uh, in some cases, you'd have to kind of accept the conclusion that lifting is worse for gains than not lifting, which is not where I'm going to plant my flag and choose my hill to die on. So, By the way, this video is sponsored by Boost Camp. So I think a lot of people probably don't need to track their nutrition as closely as they think in order to gain muscle. Fat loss is a little bit of a different story. But you should be tracking your training because that is the important variable for gaining muscle. Plus, you get access to some of the best training plans out there. Strength, hypertrophy, if you have a goal, there's probably a plan for you. I myself have four plans up on the app. You can check those out. They will treat you right. Once again, thank you to Boostcamp for sponsoring this video. And their models do have a lot of curves, which I appreciate. Uh, but in one of the curves, eating more protein gets you more gains. Okay, fair enough. But at around 1.2, 1.3 grams per kilo per day, Eating more protein gets you less gains. Bro, come on! And one of the issues with this type of analysis is that it kind of just keeps going, right? It, it gives you this, this bend and then it kind of just keeps going off into perpetuity. You know, you see that line going up. You're like, well, they only measured up to like 3.1. What if I have five grams per kilogram of fat-free mass? Even if we have almost no data out there, the line just keeps going and then hypothetically maybe you'll get more but this hasn't really been tested to infinity and beyond and a lot of head-to-head -head studies they haven't really shown any kind of benefit anywhere near to that amount of protein we have found 45 studies comparing different protein intakes that controlled for meal frequency and were generally comparable of these 45 studies none found benefits of more than 1.6 gram per kilogram per day I just don't think this analysis was very good, and I really don't think it changes anything. And I think that's part of the reason why it just was not cited very much. It wasn't because of some kind of conspiracy. It wasn't like, oh, I'm so smart. I'm the only one who found this study. I think it just wasn't very good. Oh, and then the same research group, two years later, they did a study on strength, and they found that 1.5 grams per kilo per day, basically right in line with the Morton study, maximize strength gains. Strength is not the same as hypertrophy, but I find it really hard to believe that 1.5 grams per kilo per day maximizes your strength, but you can double that and get 55% more gains for hypertrophy. It doesn't really make any sense to me. And I don't want to accuse Milo of digging up a poorly conducted, obscure, and opaque study that goes against all the other research in order to go against the grain and get clicks and views, mad riches, and ultimately bad bitches. But that might be what is going on here. I try to be charitable. He either didn't really look at the study very well and, and didn't really realize a lot of the drawbacks and shortcomings, which are very, very real, or he did and was just like, well, this is going to be great for my YouTube channel. I don't know, but neither is good. I'm, I'm intrigued to see why we're going back to that one. Can I give you my take on why we went back to it? Sure. Because of the clickbaitiness. Mm. If everyone is going, you know what? 1.6 to 2.2 established and you can go, hold on. 
but two years later, this lost meta regression suggests that actually you can go to almost twice that amount and get meaningful benefits. Yeah. It is a whoa, you know. And Eric is one of the nicest, most humble, and most agreeable people in the evidence based world. And so if he is saying even like an insinuation of clickbaitiness, you fucked up. And I'm pretty sure that Milo knew about this later 2022 analysis because he went on the Renaissance Periodization channel and he kind of had a little bit of a mix up. He said, oh, this study four years later in 2022. However, it turns out that four years later, so in 2022, there's been a more recent meta-analysis on the topic. He was actually probably referring to the 2020 paper, but a lot of people in the comments section were very confused. Why? Well, Renaissance periodization, they don't cite their sources. They can link their app in the description, that's no problem, but linking the papers they are talking about, something that every other channel in the science-based, evidence-based world can do, they somehow seem to lack the capacity and capabilities of doing so. To be blunt, this is extremely unprofessional and a little bit pathetic. And if you maybe just mention a study in passing and you don't link it, fair enough, but the entire video was about this one study, which goes against the grain of all the other reported research and is clearly just out for clicks and views. Both of you are burning your credibility to the ground, and my heartfelt advice to both Renaissance Periodization and Milo is that don't trade your credibility for clicks. It's not hard to get clicks. It's hard to get your credibility back. Now, are there exceptions where perhaps a slightly higher protein intake might make sense? Sure, if you are cutting, especially if you are already very lean, I think maybe even going above a gram per pound might make sense. I know some very, very high level natural bodybuilding coaches, they do prefer slightly higher protein intakes because they have seen benefits in their athletes from that. However, that is a pretty unusual case. For most people, most of the time, you should spend most of your time gaining if you are interested in gaining muscle. So either recomping at the end of a bulk or bulking on the way up to a recomp, but you should not spend most of your time dieting. And I don't think it really matters until you are like 10% body fat or under for most guys. If you are on anabolics, you're enhanced, whatever you want to call it, yes, eating more protein might make more sense because you can actually use it because of the drugs. If you are vegan, it might make sense just due to lower protein quality. If you're a little bit older, perhaps you can experiment with slightly higher protein intakes. And I do think that having a fixed number maybe isn't the best and a little bit of personal experimentation is a good idea. Back in like 2018, I knew a guy who was eating 1.5 grams per pound, which is a whole bunch of protein. And secretly, I wanted to say like, bro, the science doesn't confirm this. And I'm glad I didn't say anything because he had tried high protein. He had tried low protein, moderate protein. And just his personal experience was that higher protein suited his body better. And he just enjoyed it and it was sustainable and it worked for him. So I think maybe relying overly on science is not a good thing. And trying things out yourself... <gasps> might be the way to go. However, protein is expensive. It's the most expensive macronutrient. It's usually the hardest one to fit in your diet. Getting in more carbs, getting in more fats, really not that much of a challenge. It can squeeze out other macronutrients. And I've gone as high as 500 grams of protein a day. Yeah. And what happens is you either feel like shit or you feel like shitting. And those are your only two options really when you're super, super high in protein. Uh, and most of the time, when I was counting calories, I was like 150-ish grams, maybe 200, but a lot of the times I was at 100. That was kind of like my minimum. I wanted to hit 100 grams per day, and anything beyond that, I didn't really notice to have all that much of an impact. And someone should calculate how many chickens have died because of this whole thing, where some people are like, oh, I guess I gotta eat way more protein. Think of the chickens. They're organized, I know it. And ultimately, the training is way, way more important than getting in a certain amount of protein. Unless your protein is very, very low, increasing your protein is rarely what I see causing more results in the gym. It is more often just eating more food in general, which is kind of what this study shows. It's a proof that bulking works, not necessarily that protein is the thing, but it's just the training. The training is much, 
much more important than exactly how much protein you are eating. And guess what? I don't even count calories anymore. I don't count calories. I don't count macros. I don't count protein. And I notice a lot of people are shocked by that. You don't, you don't count your protein? No, I don't count your protein. But how do you know how much protein you're getting in? I don't. But how do you? And it's like their brain fucking breaks. I can see their brain break in the DMs as they realize someone is making progress without tracking their diet. So I think for most people, it's not nearly as needed as they think. I see a lot of people anxious about their protein. Maybe you should be more anxious about your set quality and your effort and your technique and your programming instead. So Milo, I'm still a fan of yours. I still like what you do, but you got to watch the clickbaitiness. You got to be careful about the information that you put out because credibility, again, is hard to get back. And um, I'm going to have to turn you into a meme. And I have the research to back that up. So whenever I see someone use evidence incorrectly, that's going to come up. Anyway, that is all for this video. Check out my books if you want more details on the stuff that is the actually important side of things, the training. Thank you so much for watching. And tell me, what do you think? All right, I'll see you next video. Peace. So, uh, how much protein you got, bro?